Welcome to the topic Faith and Heresy. These two words, faith and heresy, have in many ways shaped more than we even know history. Just think of how much art, music, and literature was inspired by faith, by some form of faith. And on the other side, how many people were killed, persecuted, expelled, due to the fact that some considered them heretics. Right? Look at what's going on in the world today. Many, the most of the battles are about faith and heresy, where some people think they have a monopoly on faith and see others as being heretics, apostates, dec- um, decadent, infidels. A lot of uh, good words. And already, and, are, and actually do kill for that purpose. So we have a history, a world that's riddled with factors that have have been defined by ideas of faith and heresy. And also on a personal level, um, much of human inspiration and motivation and drive is by some form of faith and belief in some ideal, some value system. And at the same time, we also have the judgmentalism, the unfortunate judgmentalism that comes from people who think that they have a monopoly on truth. So with all these, all the powers and all the effects that faith and heresy have, you know, the big question, however, is what does faith and heresy mean in the first place? Because after all, as Levi Yitzhak Badichever once said to a self-proclaimed atheist, he said, the God you don't, I don't believe in the God that you don't believe in either. No. In other words, if we don't first define what we mean by God and what we don't mean by God. What does faith mean? What faith is not? What is heresy? What, her- what is not heresy? Then you just have yourself a situation where people are often just replaying an old program, conditioning um, based on cultures and distrust, and not necessarily really addressing the real core issue. What is faith? Because if you think about it, if we were to able to strip ourselves of cultural impact and parental influence and education and the programming and conditioning that every society imposes on us, what would we really believe and what would we not believe? How much of our beliefs are shaped by other people teaching us or indoctrinating us and even brainwashing us in a certain belief system? So all this is what I want to address in this this class, this topic of what do we really believe and what we don't believe. And it's critical to separate between who you are and what you have become based on what others have expected of you. At the end of the day, most people's faith begins from the home, what they grew up in. And many people that reject faith, also they reject the faith that they were given to by their parents. Even uh, Abraham, the great Abraham, rejected the so-called misplaced and what he saw corrupt and false faith of his father and society, which was pagan-based, idol worship. And he embraced a new path called the path searching for God in his way. She's one of the few people in history that you can identify that actually did reject what he grew up with and forged a new path in his own searching for truth. But the rest of us, how many of us really are such pioneers and have the courage even to go on our own and look for what really faith is and what faith is not. I think this lies at the heart of one of the most important uh, uh, issues that would define us, which is what you really believe in. What is it you really believe in? And it's not even an easy question to answer, because it could very well be that what you believe in is what you were told to believe in. And it became so much part of you that you don't even know and that's why we have, and who doesn't have the conflicts? Even the most belie- the greatest believers, the people of great faith, have their moments of doubt. 
And there are people who are great heretics who also have their moment of doubt. I remember I was once interviewed the radio, <clears throat> and um, the interview was somewhat of a, I would say, skeptic, cynic, slash cynic. And in the middle of the interview, he says to me, so tell me, Rabbi, do you ever have a crisis of faith? That was the way he uh, posed it. So I began to laugh, and I said, yeah, every moment of my life. And I saw that he was like taken aback by that. I said, what do you think faith is? I said, you assume probably that faith is this childish juvenile acceptance that God is in, is, takes care of everything, and we just lay back and just sleep and be relaxed and calm because we use God and faith as a crutch. He says, that's exactly what I believe, which would mean that faith is the easy way out. The easy way out. Whatever I do, at the end of the day, God decides, and I don't have much to say about it. Very easy, cop out. And you feel, I, I was saying to him, that probably a person without faith has to struggle and so on. I said, that's not faith. What you're describing is a, what you feel it is, is a stereotype that has taken hold in society, and maybe based on a, a lot of, number of people who actually behave that way, the Woody Allen stereotype of a false and hypocritical type of faith. I told him, let me tell you what faith is. Faith is not the absence of reason. Faith is beyond reason. That after reason has brought you to many different doors, it finally brings you to a door where you have to enter with a leap of faith. You have to enter because reason itself cannot open that door. When a person, for example, after they're dating a uh, potential spouse and they finally make the decision, there's an element of faith in that. Obviously, it's informed faith. It's not a faith that is irrational. After you've met somebody and you like them and they check out, but there's still that final moment of determination, commitment, and certainty. Who has certainty? How do we know? How do you know for sure that person is for you? You have to have some measure of accepting. Now, the accepting, as I said, is informed by your research and what you've done. When an investor in, in, in decides there's two business uh, proposals, and they're both very legitimate, and he has to make a decision, is he going to spend, is he going to invest his money here or here? There's an element of faith there. It's intu intuitive faith, it's based on research, but still decisions are not purely reason-based. Because if you go with absolute 100% logic, everything can be questioned and everything has some risk. And you could say, you know, even 1% risk, I'm not ready to take it. I said, that's what faith is. And therefore, a person who has faith in God is struggles with faith because you believe in a good God, you believe that good people should prosper and the wicked should suffer and yet you see a world that's not fair and often good people suffer and wicked people prosper so you have a crisis because here you believe in a higher ideal and you don't doesn't always play itself out that way that's why i said i would challenge you in the other way around that a person without faith that's easy way out because why do you expect justice i said to him does it bother you if let's say you say a, a young child being uh, hurt by somebody for no reason does that bother you he says, yes. I said, why? Who says there's justice? Who says there's a fairness? We live in a world, dog eats dog, survival of the fittest. And who says that you're expecting justice? Does the Holocaust bother you? Yes. So I said, why? A person with no faith? Hey, there's no justice. Who says there's justice? It bothers you because you do believe in something. And it's not consistent with what you believe. That's what a person of faith is. And I remember I, it was a visible impact on him. I said, he said, I never thought of it that way. Exactly right. Because when we think of faith and heresy, we think of it mostly in the stereotypical images that we have in history, in novels, in books, in movies, the cynicism that's involved with it. You know, people of faith, yeah, 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 they believe a lot until your push comes to shove and they become just as cruel as anyone that has no faith. You see this all the time. Every cynic points that out. The hypocrisy. Say, you're a person of faith? Yeah. Let's see when it comes to your own, what they call pupik, your own uh, money or your own, we have to pay a price. And suddenly people of faith can turn and be extremely cruel and unjust and immoral. But when we talk about faith and heresy, like any real topic, you have to be able to strip it of human conventions because humans impose and uh, their viewpoints on things. And it's one of the hardest things to do. You know, when you grow up as a child, as even as a young adult, young teenager, 
you're very much influenced by everything around you. You're influenced by your friends, by your homes, by your schools, by your educators, by your home and family, of course. And from the earliest of age, you've been shaped. So it's not surprising that by the time you become a teenager, you start thinking a little for yourself. It's a very good question. How much of what you think is your thoughts and how much is it your parents' thoughts? How much is it your culture? How much is it your community? And if you really challenge yourself, you could argue that we're all brainwashed in some way because we were never asked. And, and, and obviously the reason was obvious because children are not in a position to be asked what they would prefer. They are not yet do not have the intelligence to make those choices. So for good or for bad, someone made choices for us. And by the time you're of age to begin to even question these choices that were made for you, you're usually already shaped. You're already so-called trapped. So if it's a healthy influence, so be it. But what happens if it's an unhealthy one? Let's say you grew up in a toxic environment for 15 years of your life from your birth. I'm just using a strong, a strong scenario. And then suddenly you realize, you know something, something's wrong. But you've been toxified. You've become so used to toxic air, you can't even breathe regular air. And when you see something that's healthy, it looks strange to you. You've seen this. Let's say people who were born in captivity, for example. And from the youngest days, all they knew was captivity, slavery. And then suddenly someone says to them, you know what, there's a thing called freedom. But you say to yourself, I don't deserve it. It's not, my, it's not for me. This is a typical example of a complete conditioning, of a distorted, unhealthy conditioning that change, shapes us. Now that's an extreme example. But on a subtle form, who was not born in some form of captivity in the sense are parental attitudes. And they're not always healthy. So if you, as I said, if you're blessed and you have a healthy environment, healthy education, healthy home, so good, that will, that will give you, actually it will encourage you to build up the self-confidence and the inner uh, fortitude and courage to be able to spread your wings and find your own voice and fly. But if you're not growing up in a home like that, which is unfortunately more the, more the case than, than is the majority is in that situation, then in some way you'll be, you will be impeded. You'll be impeded by the fears and insecurities and, uh, that you've been subject to and conditioned by. That's how it is. However, the good news is that doesn't mean that all is lost. Because the idea samach lechetzi refu is the expression. Awareness of a problem is have the cure. As soon as you become aware that this is toxic care, you're already in a good place. The problem is that as long as you're not aware, you can convince yourself, like I often mention the word, the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov, on the verse in uh, the book of Deuteronomy. So it says there that by um, that in that day, God says, I will conceal and twice conceal my face. That's what it says. So the question the Baal Shem Tov says, what's the haster, aster? What's the double concealment? And he says, because there's two types of darkness. There's a darkness where you know it's dark. Like now, we, most of us know it's night. And tomorrow morning will come the day. Very clear. But what happens if the darkness conceals the fact that it's dark? So it's a double concealment because the concealment conceals the concealment. And you think it's not dark. In psychology, they call it denial in other languages, it's called that you're simply not even aware there's a problem. Like what we say, you don't even know that you don't know. It's already an advantage to know that you don't know. What happens if you don't know that you don't know? And then you're trapped by the fact that you convince yourself everything is fine. So that's why the first key to all growth is called humility. That don't ever be 100% certain of anything. Because you could always be in a situation where you have a blind spot, and you convince yourself that darkness is light. Those that see darkness as light and light as darkness. Or health as illness and illness as health. And there are many, many people that are in that situation. So the first step is to not be so 100% certain. And always to, to, to check this. But if you were conditioned in an environment, in a home, where they said, we have the absolute truth, and anyone that says otherwise is the darkness... You could be very trapped by that because you've been told this is it. Everything, this is heaven and everything else is hell. When in truth, you may be in hell and, and everything on and, and the outside is heaven. So the first step is that type of awareness. So when it comes to faith and heresy, faith, what is considered faith, what is not considered faith, this is one of the 
most uh, stereotype, st- most prejudiced words there are in the dictionary, because it goes back to even the word God Himself, God itself. What does God mean? What does God mean? You know, who has a clear definition of what God is? The Sefer Erkim Yosef Alba was a great a medieval Jewish philosopher, and he said the expression, "Ili Yudaitiv Hayisiv." If I would know him, I would be him. About God. If I knew God, I would be God. So based on that principle, you could basically say none of us know who God is because we're not God. We're God's creatures. Can a creature know the Creator? You can identify that there is a Creator, but can you know the Creator? At the same time, we find the Torah expressions that God says, you shall know me. Know God. So clearly God has given us enough um, indicators to be able to know what God is like. So the question, what is God? And as I said before, most of us get that definition by default from our home and our schools, and not necessarily has it ever been challenged. And for all you know, it could be a complete false God. There are many people who think they have God, but it's false. So when you say the word faith, and you say what's not faith, it's easy words to use. This one is a person of faith, this one's a heretic person of no faith. But we first have to define, as I said before from Levi Yitzhak Baditshava, who said to the self-proclaimed atheist, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. Because we have to first define what that is. And obviously it sound, it, 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 it's, it's almost like um, um, the insanity that many of us are able to flippantly and easily use words like You're, here's a person of faith, here's a person of no faith. When you're challenged and asked what is faith, and you can't really fully answer in a coherent sentence. So how exactly are you able to designate who's a person of faith who's not faith? So here's a question I've uh, posed to a number of, I don't know if I would say colleagues of mine, but people consider themselves very, uh, what they call charedim. Charedim means like uh, people, actually charedim means the trembling ones, the ones that tremble before God. You know, now... um, that's also a question, who really trembles before God? Are they, are they, what trembling means in the first place? From the word charada, a great tremble, a great uh, pachad, a great fear. So um, we live in a world where uh, media and maybe self, uh, uh, people have uh, identified themselves as from, and the people are not from. Religious, not religious. I personally always disliked all these terms from my youngest of age for some reason. Then I didn't really understand why, but today I do. The reason was because I always wondered who created these terms. Who determined? Who determined? Had God, God come down from a mountain and said, hey, here's the group of the from, here's the group of the not from. These are my Yerushalayim, the people who fear me and serve me, and these are the persons that don't serve me. That's one thing. But did God appear to anybody that you know on earth and told them that? So, of course, the argument goes, that we have a Torah, and the Torah tells us what the standards are. The Torah says, here's if you do this and this and this and this, you are considered a so-called follower or adherent or shamer uh, Torah mitzvah, someone that keeps and fulfills the Torah and its commands. And if you do so and so, you're not shamer Torah mitzvah. Okay, well, let's go with that approach, fine. So what is the biggest mitzvah of all in the Torah? What is the single biggest mitzvah? So it's true we're told that we're not supposed to measure and weigh. A mitzvah should be kala kechamura, that even a light, a linear mitzvah should be as committed to it as, as, as a harsh mitzvah because it's all God's will. But yet it's called kala chamura. We do know there are categories. There are mitzvahs that you have the penalties for the mitzvahs are much more severe than others. So what's the single biggest mitzvah? So this is not my, it's not my theory. This is stated in the Talmud, in the Medrash. In two different places. One is in the words of Rabbi Akiva, kamocha, love your fellow like yourself. This is the great Klal Torah. And Hillel, that's a Medrash on the verse in Kedeshim, in Leviticus, on that verse that talks about loving another. And Hillel in the Talmud in Shabbos, in the uh, Tractate of Shabbos, uh, page 30, says, in different terms, he says, when the convert, the potential convert, comes to him and asks him, teach me the entire Torah standing on one foot. So he says, 
Madal in Aramaic, what, what, that which you dislike, do not do unto others. What they call the golden rule. Which is really just the reverse of a haftarach kamach. Love your fellow, which means don't do to your fellow that which you don't want done to you. And then he continues, he says, Zuhi kol kula. This is the entire Torah. Those are Hillel's words. And the idach zil gemar. The idach perusha zil gemar. And the rest is commentary. Now go learn. So he gave him the whole Torah standing on one foot. So based on this, and there's no disagreement on this, there's no disagreement about this being the Klal Godel or this on. Everybody agrees. That is the foundation of everything. And even practically, how many mitzvahs are derivatives of loving a fellow? You could say, for example, guests visiting the sick, nichum avelim, which is consoling the, the, grieve, the, the grieve, grievers, and so on. These are all derivatives of Avis Yisrael, essentially. And, and yet, so let's now go back to the Charedim. So you ask them, so which mitzvah are you so tremble before God? You'll find that they tremble a lot more about how they dress than about how they treat other people. Which, of course, is like unbelievable distortion. Nowhere in the Torah does it say that dress is the Klal Godel of the Torah. As a matter of fact, yes, there's a concept of not changing our garments, but you can't even compare it close to Avis Yisrael, which is a direct mitzvah, Esa Daraisa, meaning a written law, and law, Laisisna, which is the opposite, do not hate, and in the words of Hillel, and so on. And yet you don't find anyone saying, I'm a Kanoi, I'm a zealot, over the biggest mitzvah in the Torah. You don't tell me if that's not a distortion. This doesn't take away from people being committed to Shabbos and kosher and a lot of things. Great. But I remember once at a, I was at a wedding and they sat me at a table with rabbis, which is never where I like to sit. It's not the place, you know, I don't come for this as an honor for me, as you see from what I'm saying. I'd rather be a simple Jew instead of being a rabbi, or orthodox, quote unquote. Um, I know some of what I may say sounds anti-Semitic, but I'll reassure you that some, some of my best friends are Jews. Uh, so I'm sitting at this table, and they bring out the lettuce, and the, you know, the beginning of the dinner. They serve lettuce. And one rabbi, without mentioning names, so there won't be any lush and horror here, um, one rabbi, prominent man, people know him, he decides to check to see if this lettuce is up to his standard. So he stands up and takes the lettuce and points it up to the, like the chandelier to check for bugs. And, but in a way that everybody saw, you know, anyone, it's very, very prominent, wasn't doing it discreetly. He's looking and checking and checking and checking. And I'm just watch, sitting there watching it. Then he sits down. I guess he found it was to his, to his standards. I'm not going to tell you how he ate the salad. Not, as one would say, a discreet tamachachim should eat. You know, he seemed to be very hungry. But, um, but he uh, definitely checked the bugs. So another rabbi on the table, who's from his school of thought, says to him, you know, malbim pnei chaveri berabim salt, embarrass someone. Whereas eating lettuce with a bug is at best, at worst, I should say, a uh, sophic to Rabbanon, which means a doubtful question from rabbinic law, not in Torah law, not written. So basically, you're ready to be over, to, uh, to violate a Torah edict in order to show how religious you are. This is what he tells him. Of course, this guy quite, got quite insulted, and now he was Malvan Pnei Chaver at the table, at least. He insulted him, so everybody was even. He insulted the hosts. The rabbi was insulted. And I was sitting there smiling to myself. Now, God forbid, smiling. I wasn't happy to hear this. But to me, this captured the whole story of Jewish life, where people are more into their selves than into what God wants. Because if you really want to know what God wants, let's start with Avis Yisrael. If I saw that the most religious people on earth were all rushing to love every Jew unconditionally and to do whatever it takes, then, by all means, then you can honor them and being true leaders. But when you see people who choose and pick and whatever their culture decides is is considered to be from, that's the most important thing. And things that are fundamental principles in Judaism are ignored, you have to wonder what what is going on. Now I speak as an insider. I grew up not in the outside world. I grew up in the so-called from world. That's why I know it quite well. I know its strengths. I know its weaknesses. This is one of the most... um, 
disturbing elements. For some reason, as I said, even when I was younger, I used to always be disturbed by it because it always looked to me like something was wrong. And now I understand it very well. People choose and pick. It has very little to do with what God wants. It's to do with the culture. And different cultures have what they consider standards. And certain things, if you break those standards, to them that's like the worst possible sin. When anyone who knows a little Torah knows, it's not the worst, they're far bigger things. It always bothers me till this day that Abbas Yisrael, if you really, if you don't want to be a religious or committed person to God, you're a selfish person, by all means, then do what you want. Not that it's good, but, but if you consider yourself a God-fearing person, why is it that you're not choosing the most important mitzvahs first and, and the rest comes second? My father was a journalist. And I say was because I don't think in heaven they have journalists. They don't need uh, media reporting there um, or entertainment. So my father, so she drove over. She drove over from Tel Aviv, and we had a meeting with her. And she said she knew my father back then when they both began. They were both young, in the early '60s. Um, my father actually took over the position from Elie Wiesel, who used to be the correspondent, but then he went off to write his book, Night, and in other books. So my father took over the position from him. So they had met at a press conference. This woman tells tells us. She, she was a young, brash, Israeli, abrasive, as the way she put it, journalist. And my father was a bearded yarmulke guy, which you don't really find in the world of journalism, in the so-called global journalism. But they met in Washington, D.C. by some press conference. And she says, as, as Israelis go, you know, Israelis like to be right in your face with a chutzpah. She went over to my father. She says, I see you're new on the job, and I'm also new on the job. I just want you to know that I hate religious Jews. Why she needed to say that, I'm not really sure. She told us, she said, but that's, you know, that was what, how Israeli style is. You just tell everything is transparent. Okay. And so she said, you know, we're going to probably interact because we'll both be in different conferences and press conferences and media, etc. I just don't like it. Religious Jews. Okay. My father said to her, this is what she tells us. My father was not insulted. He wasn't taken aback. He says to her very calmly, he says, let me ask you something. You visit the sick? Yeah, I visit the sick. You honor your parents? Yeah, I honor my parents. You give charity? Yes, I give charity. So my father said, you know, you're more religious than me. And she suddenly realized how, uh, how childish and immature what she said to my father. And my father said, changed her whole life. Not that, you know, she said, I never became fully observed, but I said, what kind of idiot statement? You come over to a guy, what is it, like, what, two, two, two-year-olds here? And he made a good point. Who determines, I determine what's religion because he has a beard and a yarmulke. But what about honoring parents and giving charity and, and, and visiting the sick? These are real mitzvahs. So what makes me le- more, less religious than someone else? I may be more religious in certain areas. I remember she just came all the way from Tel Aviv. She was already an 80-year-old woman, 75, when she came over. And it was like very moving because she remembered it. It was at least uh, 50 years before. But you don't forget certain things like that. And I'll never forget, it was a very interesting answer. I asked a lot of people, what would you say if someone told you that? My father had his way, and he, this is the way he put it. And it's 100% correct. Now, this doesn't take away, as I said, there are 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. 248 positive, 365 negative. So obviously they're all vital and all important. But what we call, they're things like, just like in a human body, they're vital organs that are necessary for survival, and there are secondary organs. Same thing is with mitzvahs. There are mitzvahs that are considered yusaydis, which means foundational, that if you take that away, the foundation falls. And there are other mitzvahs, as as important as they are, they're not as foundational. And the Torah itself designates which is which. How the distortions came into our society over the years is another study and probably deserves a book or two, but there are definitely distortions. And these distortions affect all of us, both people who are consider themselves observant and both that not. Because those that are not are getting wrong impressions. So when you see, for example, someone that calls himself a, uh, a, uh, a religious person pulled off to prison for some very uh, heinous or criminal acts, you start saying, yeah, that's how they all are, a bunch of hypocrites. But they, you know, they dress a certain way, that's it, that's the impression. It's exactly what people think. And it, it just puts a black... That's why Chil Hashem, which is one of the worst possible sins, again, yet another sin that people do not really think about too much. Chil Hashem, which means to desecrate God's name, in some ways is considered the worst possible sin. I know most people say the worst sin is idolatry, murder, 
uh, incest. Yes, those three, the three sins that you're supposed to die before you, uh, uh, before you violate them. But Chil Hashem in its way, which is desecrating, and also Kiddush Hashem, which is sanctifying God's name, are considered in some ways the biggest, because those create a ripple effect that you can never change. There's a story in the Talmud that says, I think it was Rabbi Chia, I don't remember. He's a Talmudic sage, that when he'd go buy meat, he never bought on credit. Even though credit is a legitimate form of payment, you know, then and now as well. You know, you tell the, the, the owner, I mean, obviously we're not talking about forcing, the owner says, okay, you'll pay me later, fine. There's an agreement, I, you know, I'll give you the product now, I'll give you the goods, and you'll repay me later. But he would not, refuse to buy on credit, why? Because just in case somebody may see him taking the meat and not paying, they'd think he's stealing. Mara sign for a form of chil Hashem, which means it doesn't look appropriate. Now, if he was just a regular guy, okay, they could assume that he is a... But, but since he's a rabbi, and he's a distinguished rabbi, and respected, he went beyond the letter of the law. There was nothing wrong to buy on credit, but he went beyond the letter, so there shouldn't be any ever false impression. Now, you talk about, you talk about uh, refinement, edelkeit. This is refinement. Do we have people like this today? Yes, there are people. I have no people of this caliber who behave in a way that when you look at them, they sanctify God's name. The Sifri is a medrash that says on the Pasuk, on the verse, we say in Shema, after the Shema we say, Hashem which means to love, you shall love God. But the Sifri interprets Vahafta in an interesting way. It says, you shall make God beloved, which means when someone looks at you, and sees you as a godly person, you will make God beloved, because they say, if this is what a godly person looks like, this is a God I want to have a relationship with. And Nachil Hashem is the exact opposite. If this is what God looks like, a person that's supposed to be a godly person, behaves, I don't want to have any connection to God. That's called, that's the worst possible thing, thing you can do, because if a person gets turned off like that, then you have caused directly somebody to never want to look at this direction again. Now when you start telling people, one second, this was just this person, it's not the system, it's not the, the group, it's not the community. Yeah, 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 I know that, all that stuff. Which, it is the truth. We never can judge anyone by people. People are people. You have to judge it by the standards that the Torah, the book, uh, offers. Not by how people live up to it. But at the end of the day, let's, we are human beings, and we do judge things by how the people that follow it behave. So this brings me back to the whole topic of, of faith and heresy. So there's an interesting Talmudic statement in the tractate called Brachas, and it's especially in the Ein Yankov is this uh, particular girsa, as they say, this version. So it says an Aramaic expression. Gamva, apumachtarta, rachmona karye. A ganif, a thief, before he goes out to steal, to steal. He prays to God that he should succeed. Interesting phenomenon, right? Now, the question is, how exactly does this work? Sounds like an insane person. God says, it's one of the Ten Commandments, lay signev, you shall not steal. So how does a guy go pray to God and say, it's one thing, I ignore God, I avoid Him, I don't think God's watching, or I'm in denial, or whatever it may be. But, what, but to go say, I'm going to pray to God, please help me do something that you told me not to do. It's like you're going to hire the boss to help you steal from the boss. That sounds a little strange, right? You don't, normal people wouldn't do that. And yet there is this phenomenon. And Hasidic thought it t- uses this as a case study of all of us. Not just hypocrisy, but the dissonance that we're capable of. That you could be a person who believes in God, and you even follow and pay a price. Follow God's laws, and you, and you follow, and you are adherent and pious. And yet there suddenly comes something. You get a blind spot, and you can do something completely contrary. And you can even pray that God help you do something that's contrary to the whole belief system. So how is this possible? The answer is, in English, we call it dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. There's emotional dissonance. In, uh, in Hasidic terminology, it's called makif. What does that mean? That the faith is there, but it's makif. It means it surrounds you, but it's not penetrated you. You know, you have a, an abstract faith. You have a certain type of, in theory, or even in practice, but it's still not integrated. Which is possible. Very often we have things that we identify with, but they're not integrated. They're not one with you. 
so you believe in it, and maybe you may follow it, but it's very easy for you to have a, a disconnect where you suddenly will do something that's gone completely contrary to that belief system and faith. So this is not, doesn't make the person a bad person. It doesn't make the person uh, evil. It's just it's a part of reality that we have to understand that we're capable of. And everyone's capable of that. So as I said earlier, the word faith, therefore, is far more complicated than just, oh, I believe 24-7 I'm doing exactly what God wants. I wish we could find people like that. The great Rabbi Yechonim ben Zakkai, one of the greatest sages, on his deathbed, he tells his students, may, halavai, may you have fear of God as much as you have fear of human beings. This is not the 20th century, 21st century. This is Rabbi Yechonim ben Zakkai in the time of the Talmud. He's talking to God-fearing, pious scholars and sages and, and, and God-fearing, pious Jews. And yet he still tells them, may you fear God as much as you fear human beings. Because the bottom line is, God is invisible. And as much as you have faith, it's very easy to forget that God is standing right near you. So even though you may believe that God is watching everything you're doing, you may have that faith, it's still not integrated. It's very different than living that way. So we may believe that 24-7 God's right with us. If someone asks you that, you say, absolutely. But you don't live up to that. So then the question is, is this a person of faith or no faith? The answer is, it's not a contradiction. Because faith can be what's called makif. It can be, it can surround you. It can be like a, an idea that you accept, but it's not penetrated. It's not shaped you. It's not changed you. And I'll use an example of something I once discussed in this class a number of times. The difference between, let's say, a good person and a person who does good things. Now, it may sound synonymous. A person who's a good person does good things. A person who good, does good things is a good person. Not exactly. Because you can have a person who does many good things, but they're not necessarily a good person. It's not a 24-7 thing that, is, that identifies them. It's what's called in, the, in, the, in Jewish thought, there is, when we, we describe different names, there's a thing called a Shema Etzem. It's the name of, an, of, the, of the emhus, of the essence of, an, of the core of an item, of an object or a person. Then there's a thing called Hashem, ha, Hashem Atoyar. Hashem Atoyar describes the object. Let's say you'll say a yellow sun, like an adjective. It describes it. A hot sun, a hot bath. So bath would be, let's say, the Hashem Atsem. That's what it is. Hashem Atoyar is a description of it. Then there's a thing called Hashem HaPu'ula the name of the function of that object. Like a warm bath is a place you go to relax or to wash yourself. That's its function. So the function, the name, the functional name. And then there's a thing called Shem Hamushal, that's a nickname or a, uh, or a, um, a metaphorical name and so on. So when you say things have names, they have different things. There's the name of the core thing and there's the name of its uh, shape and form, its, 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 uh, its uh, function. And, so, and, and other like, uh, nicknames that you may give something, uh, that you may name. So when you talk about um, in the context of what I'm describing now about a good person, a good person is a Hashem Etzem. That's describing this person is a good person through and through. Even when it's inconvenient, and even when they're asleep, they're a good person. Because whatever you touch, whatever they touch will, become, will be goodness. A person who does good things, that's a functional name. His function is that he has a function that is good. He's doing functional good things. So I shared this. I once spoke about it in a class here. And a guy came over to me after the class and said, like, you know, a man in the early 50s, with tears in his eyes, he tells me, you know, tonight you've answered a question, a dilemma I've had most of my life. Since I'm a young child, I grew up in a home, he said, my father was a very big philanthropist, very giving person, helped people. I remember Monday nights, from the youngest of age, anyone who came to our house, the door was open, and you never left empty-handed. Either it was financial money or a loan, a job, a favor, a connection, whatever it was. Anything, my father did not deny anyone when they came on Monday nights. And yet at the same time, my father was also sometimes quite cruel to me, to my mother, to my family. And if he came on Tuesday night, when he had his poker game, his weekly poker game, nobody was allowed at the door. It didn't matter whether he was dying of hunger. 
And I've always, as a child, this was a very deep inconsistency. Because on one hand, he did great things, and I really was amazed at his giving. And yet, I saw another side to him. So then I came to realize, tonight, you answer the question, that it's no contradiction. There are good people, and there are people who do good things. My father was not necessarily a good person. He did many good things, and he gets credit for it, but he was not necessarily a good person because it was only when it was convenient for him. And it's much better than, than other people who don't do it even then. But it could have been a, just a custom. His father may have done it Monday night, so he did it Monday night. Tuesday night, or when it was inconvenient, no. Again, I'm not taking away, you said, my credit for my father, but it, make, it puts things into context. And he's absolutely right. This is called the dissonance that one can have of faith. You can have faith and behave in ways that are not consistent with it. The problem is when people start looking for excuses and they say, no, I'm really this. Being honest about it is the first step in all situations. So the concept of faith is far more complicated than just somebody who says, I believe. And, because there's no way that you could just believe. If Rabbi Yechon ben Zaki would not have to have to say to his students, that may you fear God as much as you fear humans if, they, if their faith was through and through. Because why do they have to they fear God? God is with them all the time. Because we live in a world where it's easy. Because God concealed his presence from us for us to have faith and not necessarily live up to it. That's the first honest statement that a person has to make. So now let's talk about heresy. You meet people, for example, who say they don't believe in God. Or they completely deny Torah or, if, or, or anything that is considered to be sacred or divine. Now, it's very easy to dismiss and say, oh, you know what, I'm the person of faith, and here's a heretic. But as Levi Yitzhak Baditchever said, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. What kind of God did this person grow up with? And in general, what kind of God do we all have? Maybe in a way we're all atheists. If you start defining your God, you may discover this is a very false God. For example, many people, when push comes to shove, and I've tested this because I've given classes and I've challenged people with this question, I said, so tell me, describe God. So many people, um, their God is somewhat of a juvenile nursery school version, which goes like this. God is this, this guy, this old man in heaven with a long white beard that sits on a throne and strikes us with lightning when we misbehave. Now, not if most people will say that, but when you say it, many people say, yeah, that sounds more or less it. Now, why do we have that impression? Because no one ever told us anything else. We, everything we identify in this world is defined by things we see. You know, the big angry principle in our school. So God must be like a thousand times worse than that angry principle. That's our point of reference. We look at authorities and we say, oh, that's authority. God is even a bigger authority. Now, if we had good examples... Yeah, we may have a good image of God. That I have a warm, very nice grandfather, and God is a thousand times or a million times or infinite amount of times kinder than my great, my, my, my grandfather was. So basically what we call anthropomorphism, which is you're taking human interactions and opposing them upon God, which if you really think about it is really um, a distortion, no matter what, if we're for good or for bad. Why? Because remember, God created us in his image, and now you're creating a God in your image. It's the exact opposite of what it should be. So the question then is, so how do I find out what God is? What, else, what other point of reference do I have? You know? Well, the answer it comes down back to Torah. Without studying what the Torah says about God, yes, you won't have a, an objective and a healthy view of God. And I would submit that most people do not have a very uh, sophisticated understanding of God because no one ever told us what it's like. So where do we pick it up? We may have instinct, we may feel that God wants of us to be the best we can be, but that's not necessarily a description. So where do you turn to? The, and the only answer really could be that only God himself could tell us what he's like. Because any human being is going to say their version of it, which is going to be a human version. So we then, therefore have to look in the Torah, and where in the Torah do we have descriptions of God? So you have a few. There's the place where Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, says to God, when you send me to Egypt, the people are going to ask me, what's your name? Who, who, so, he's, so God answers a very cryptic, Eye Asher Eye. Which means, literally means, I am who I am. Or I will be what I will be. Well, what does that mean? So Maimonides, the Rambam, has an entire chapter 
in modern Nebuchim, the God is perplexed, explaining that verse. Because there you have one of the few times where God is asked, who are you? And God says. And you have other places. You, for example, and I'm not even going now yet into the deeper interpretations. In the beginning of the era, also in the story with Exodus, where God says to, um, to, to uh, Moses that I have revealed myself, the name Kael Shaddai to the others, to the, to the patriarchs, but to you, Vashmi Havaya Lena Daiti Lehem. But the name Havaya, Yud Kei Vovke, the Tetragrammaton, the four letter name, Yud Kei Vovke, that I did not reveal. And to you I will reveal it. So there again, we need interpretation, of course, what it means. And of course, right in the beginning of the Torah that I just referred to, God said, Let us create a human being in our image, in my image, Salam Alekim. So what exactly is it, Salam Alekim? There was this philosopher, I think it was Abraham Joshua Heschel, used to challenge his students and say, where in the Torah does God transgress the cardinal sin? The cardinal sin, of course, is idolatry. You should not make a pestle, you should not make anything that's in the image of God. And where does God transgress it? When he created the human being, he created something in his own image. So it's an interesting twist, how could God do that? So obviously the answer is multiple, that if you worship yourself, then yeah, then it's a very desire. But if you see yourself as a reflection of God's presence, it's a different story. The problem with a very desire is that you're replacing God, not that you see that it's God's creation. But, that's, but the point I'm making here, so we do have t- terms in the Torah where God somewhat reveals part of himself. These are Atta Hareso Ladas. By Matan Torah, by Sinai, we say we saw something. Something was seen. What was seen? Now, frankly, I remember when I was going to yeshiva, I, I asked my teachers a few times these questions. Then I stopped asking because I realized that they don't have an answer. And more importantly, they uh, would see me as a uh, what we call a rebellious. And the question was, why does no one talk about this? Like This is like the most intriguing part of the Torah. Let's find out what God is like a bit. Now, we're not talking about things that we don't know. We're talking about where God reveals. And we, we learn so much about what God wants of us. And when the places, when it comes, that, you know, this first most important thing that we're creating the divine image. Isn't that intriguing? Well, you know, that, that's tremendous. What is a human being? We're creating the divine image. Does anyone know what that means, Eve? It's a nice statement. It's right in the beginning of the Torah. And no very few people have a clue what that means. And it can go on and on and on and find verses like this. So, I speak from my own personal experience, since this intrigued me, so I went to search. And what ultimately I discovered when you study Kabbalah, Kabbalistic, mystical texts, and Hasidic texts, they take these verses and they talk about it for thousands of pages. I'm not exaggerating. Obviously not in one book, in many different books. Analyze and analyze and analyze. What does this mean, this image of God that we are created in? What does it mean that we can emulate God's ways? What does it mean that we're connecting with God? Now, it's interesting because when you think about it, many people, and I've, I've talked to many rabbis about this, you can imagine, say to me, some people will say, one second, we are creatures, we're lowly, inferior creatures, we're mortals. You think you're going to try to understand what a creator is? The infinite, a finite mortal creature is going to understand the infinite, immortal God? So what then is our relationship? We're simple subjects. We're slaves. We're servants of God. A servant doesn't have to understand his master. You do your job. What's your job? Whatever the Torah says. Do this, don't do this. So think of a a servant. You want to put a slave, a servant. Servants are not supposed to understand anything. It's none of their business what the master is like. The master tells you to do this. That's what you're supposed to do. And you'll be rewarded. That's a very common answer you find even in very sophisticated so-called scholarly circles. However, there's one, a few fundamental problems with this. Problem number one is the Torah itself, if it was only mitzvah smicius, if we were only given command to do actions, then you could say, okay, like a servant. I serve the table, I eat so-and-so, I, this is how I sleep, this is how you marry, this is how you die, this is how you do everything from morning to night. But there's a whole bunch of mitzvahs that are not small mitzvahs that talk about via daita to know God, vahafta to love God, da'asalakeh. A whole bunch of mitzvahs that talk about mitzvahs which call levovius, 
mitzvah sheba machshava and mitzvah sheba love, which means mitzvahs that are not just pure action. You don't ask a servant, there's no mitzvah that a servant has to love his master or has to know his master. Here you have a whole bunch of commandments that are absolutely much far more uh, evol- uh, far more uh, uh, refined, loftier than just actions. So right there, God himself is saying, I don't just want a servant. And then when you look at the, the verses, as well as the prayers, yes, em kibonim, em kavadim, em kibonim. There are times we, we are like a servant to God as a master, but there are times we're like children. And there are times we're called shutaf la kadosh baruch hu We're partners. You don't say in a servant a partnership. There's no partnership going on. And that God, in a sense, depends on us. He creates a world and he wants us to refine this world. So that's problem number one. You can't just dismiss it as being a simple inferior creature serving the great master. Even though there's a truth to that, but it's not only that. It's not limited to that. Problem number two is that God blessed us with intelligence. If he wanted us to be servants, then he should create us like animals. Animals are very good servants. They're even servants to human beings. They don't think. You can subjugate them. You can control them. But we have a whole, a whole other side to us. A whole side to us that thinks independently. And we feel. So one, I remember one particular individual said to me, when I told him this, he said, that's the Nisayan. God gave us a mind and a heart in order not to use it. Just like the Yetzirah. You, you created with a mind and a heart not to use it. I burst out laughing. That was, I never heard that one before. In other words, the whole point of having a mind and a heart is, is like a test. You think you're going to use it? So don't use it. Be dumb, blind and mute, and just follow orders. I said to him, which yeshiva taught you this? And he told me the name of the yeshiva. And then I heard it from other people. No one maybe says, spells it out quite that way. But I found that to be quite uh, something. I said, what about the mitzvahs that talk about to use your mind? Well, yeah, okay, then you're doing that also like a servant. God says, use your mind, so you use your mind. You know, animals also use their mind somewhat to hunt, to breed, etc., etc. Anyway, obviously I'm not going to go address that because to me the whole, that's a, you know, somewhat of, a, more than a distortion about what faith is. So we talk about faith and heresy. To me that's heresy, actually. It's really not heresy, it's ignorance. It's tam, it's tam nonsense. You know, which is not like intentional, just some, it's, it's, it's just, it, it. and then you have, of course, finally, these statements that we are created in God's image. What do you do with that? We don't say that about an animal or a monkey or a cow or whatever animal is out there. It doesn't say that at all. Only one entity is called B'Tselem Elikim, and that's the human being. So clearly, it's not just yet another subject of God's, because you don't create a servant in your own image. A servant is here to serve. You don't have to be in the image of the master. And then when you look at my man, Hain hoya odam ka'achad mimenu, the Pasuk says, the verse says, that this man will be like one of us. And my man says that's the power of free will. So once we have free will, then you go into a whole other entity, which is that only God could give us free will, because only God has free will. Nothing else in existence has free will. So free will is the best indicator that we're more than just servants. We are given the ability to choose. <clears throat> so I don't want to belabor the point there are many other arguments that could be made but this is why the Kabbalists the mystics and the Zohar and many of the holy Kabbalistic works of the Arizal and others and of course Hasidic teachings go with a whole different approach it's not a servant with God it's a far more complicated relationship there's a true interface and we really can create a relationship with God does that mean that we're on the same level? Obviously not. But God chose to want to have a relationship with us. That's the bottom line. And once he chose wants to have a relationship, then he, there's, it's a true relationship. And that's why Shir Hashirim, the classic book of Song of Songs of King Solomon, which talks about like a romantic story between two human beings, a man and a woman, the Rambam, Maimonides, and others write that this is a mushal, a metaphor for a relationship with God. So suddenly takes on a hold that the relationship of man and woman on earth is a metaphor, is an example of what kind of relationship God wants with us, which of course then brings to life statements like Yem Chasinose is a Matan Torah. Matan Torah is like a marriage day. And other expressions of like a Ish and Isha, a man, woman, sometimes refers to Torah, sometimes the Jewish people, God, 
chos and kala, and all those expressions, bride, groom and bride. So then, then we can see our, our human relationships as examples for a relationship with God. Now, did God have to have to do that? Of course he didn't have to. And God always remains God, but he chose and wants to have that. So when you think of it that way, faith then dictates a whole new way of looking at life. Most people think faith is simply God is up there, I'm down here, I'm his subject, I'm his servant, and that's that. Either I follow or I don't follow. No, no, no. Faith is a full-bodied, comprehensive relationship between an entity called the divine and an entity called existence, creature and the creator. And there's commonality. We have commonality with the divine. That's why we're creating the divine image. And if you could say in one sentence, what is the whole purpose of Kabbalah and Chassidus in a way, by extension, is how do you understand this relationship? How can you really fuse and create an interface between the divine and the diabolical, if you wish, between the divine and the mundane, when they seem to be so far apart? So God created what the Hasidic terminology is, a seder ishtalshlus. Think of it like stepping stones. So if God is completely beyond us, and we're here, stepping stones that give us the ability to retrace the steps. And then you understand, of course, the dream of Jacob when he dreamt of what? A ladder, Sula Mutzavatsa. Think of the words. A ladder, Mutzavatsa, standing on the ground. Vereshe Magia Hashemaima. And its head goes into heaven. So this is understood. Sulam is compared to, a, to prayer. Prayer is like a four-runged ladder. And we have the ability to travel to heaven every time we pray. It's a journey from the material to the spiritual. And the malachim that go up and down are representatives of spiritual energy, both directions, multidirectional. So when we study Torah, or we pray, and we do mitzvahs, what we're doing is we're creating an interface of connections. A mitzvah comes from the word connection, tzafsa of chibur, between two realities. The reality that we know in this material world and the divine reality which is completely beyond us. But like stepping stones, like growth, we grow first, we're spoon-fed, then we grow more, we grow, we grow, we grow, until we build a full-bodied relationship, a full-dimensional relationship with the divine. So then when you think of faith in that context, it takes on a whole different meaning. It's more than just a childish, oh, I believe in God. No, it's more than that. It's a belief system that connects itself with a whole system, a process, rather, of, of uh, joining or rejoining with the source. So I've told this, uh, think, uh, this uh, joke story that I've mentioned a number of times. In the early years of this class, going back now to the previous century, it's the previous millennium for that matter, 20th century in the year 1982 is when this class began, a long time ago. Any of you were born yet? Oh, okay. Good. 82. So I just began this class. So that would be 34 years ago. And it didn't even begin as a class. It began as like a conversation, which I think it still remains to be somewhat like that. And I remember in the beginning, the early years, the people that came were people from the arts and entertainment industry. Yeah, musicians, songwriters, so many, most were Jewish, all very spiritual, but not traditional in any way. And some were actually very anti-traditional, I would say, because they, they went through, they had their share of, of hollow and empty bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah lessons that turned them off from all of Judaism. You know, rabbis that had absolutely no soul and no connection. And it was just completely a technical thing to make their parents happy or whatever. And uh, they had the different stereotypes like I described before. So I remember the following. I remember <clears throat> thinking to myself that before I even opened my mouth, I was sitting with I mean, good people, but they look at me with a beard and a yarmulke, and I'm sure I'm evoking some, it's not a neutral image, so I'm sure I'm evoking some stereotypes. Maybe I'm reminding them of an irrelevant Hebrew school teacher that, that uh, taught them these empty bar mitzvah lessons, or... Uh, an angry grandfather that slept them to Shul on Yom Kippur against their will when they wanted to go play, whatever. Or maybe even good memories. So I decided to try an experiment. An experiment was like this. Instead of using any terms that were uh, religious, like the word God, Torah, mitzvahs, 
Averus, Mashiach, whatever, I decided to create my own language that was neutral, so it was not loaded in any way. So I didn't use any words that they could identify or trace to so-called Jewish sources. So what was the language I used? Instead of the word God, I used the word higher reality, or the essence of all of existence. It was a particularly new age group, I said, things like um, undefined layers of uh, unconscious energy or something like that. Um, instead of uh, uh, Torah, I used the word blueprint, blueprint for creation. Instead of mitzvahs, I used the word connections. And instead of averas, I used the word disconnections, which is actually the meaning of aver and mitzvah, just like the meaning of Torah. Everything, I didn't say anything untrue. I just did not use the Hebrew or anything, even English translations of the Hebrew words. And instead of Mashiach, Geula, I used the word destination. And here I was waxing eloquent and pontificating on the way you journey into the essence of reality and the essence of yourself by following this blueprint and making connections and avoiding disconnections all to get to a point where you reach the final destination of the fusion between matter and spirit, inner and outer, the unconscious and the conscious, form and function, you get the idea. And it'd be a total seamless flow from in the inner, the mo- innermost to the outermost. And I remember everybody was listening, they were like mesmerized, I have to say. After a few weeks, a guy comes over to me and says to me, are you talking about God? Because I mentioned nothing, no reference. I said, yes, but shh, don't spoil it for the others. Now, this experiment worked better than I expected because as a communicator, I can tell you, you know, we all know, especially in today's day and age, it's called the therapeutic age. Everybody's going to therapy. So it's like people are taught, communicate. You got to communicate because the other person does not know what you're thinking. Don't assume they know what you're thinking. So you got to talk. Break the silence. You've been hurt. Speak about it. You can't carry it inside of you. So there's no question communication creates a certain openness and a connection. However, communication could also be overdone, but people don't know how to stop speaking. And all they're doing is indulging in their speaking. And sometimes speaking can also create disconnection. Why? Because if I use words that are loaded, and to you, to me they mean nothing, but I may say a word that causes you to go ballistic, because every time your mother said the every time you use the word, your mother went crazy or something. So when you have that type of attitude and approach, so... Um, Words can also be traps. Words can also be things that disconnect us. And here is a perfect example. Any religious terms can be, are loaded. And that's why the experiment worked so well. You know, like the guy that comes to the, the Jew, that comes to the priest, who wants to confess his sins. And the priest is so taken by the fact that a Jew came to the priest. So he says to him, you know, my, you know, my son, you know, when did you come to this truth and recognize that I... That Christianity is uh, the the is the place to confess. So he said to the priest, "Don't take it personally. I'm telling everybody, you know. It's not just some kind. so. This that's the over the over communication. So basically, words can be loaded, and when you, and this is a good lesson in life in general. Sometimes let's say, in uh, called uh, in, uh, marital counseling, or shalom bias issues, domestic issues, even between parents and children, or between spouses and so on." Friends, sometimes you have a serious disagreement. And one of the methods to use is to sometimes just rephrase your whole terminology. You don't have to even say the same. You can say exactly the same thing. Use different words. Because words become traps. You know, every time you, you do that, you often hear a wife will tell her husband, every time you get nervous, you always say this and this word. And when suddenly you use different words, it's disarming because it doesn't have the, the, the history and it doesn't have the whole, um, the whole loadedness of a word that you use all the time. And you'd be amazed how much you can get through sometimes just using different words. The same idea. You have to, I wouldn't force it, and I wouldn't try to impose it. But words can be very interestingly also that separate people. And here is a perfect example. So when we talk about these ideas called faith and heresy and God. It's critical because these words are so loaded and so misunderstood, as I mentioned, I have rarely seen people who have a very good, sophisticated presentation that can tell you this is what God is like for me. 
Because if you haven't thought it through, you're not going to have an answer like that. And most of us don't think about it. We just are by knee-jerk reaction. The God of our parents is usually our God. Or the other way around. We reject that and we and so on. You know, there's a very beautiful thought from the Baal Shem Tov. He says, we say in the Amida prayer, in the, every three times a day, we say, Elokeinu velokei avaseinu elokei avram Yitzhak v'yakov. Elokeinu means our God. Elokei the God of our, father, of, our, of our parents. And then the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the question is asked, chronologically, should be reversed. First it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then it became God of our parents. And then comes us. So why does it begin with Elokeinu? And his answer is brilliant. So simple, but brilliant. He says, because when you're a child growing up, obviously you begin by hearing what your parents say. But when you become an adult, it has to be your God. You have to own it. You shouldn't be worshipping the God of your parents. You should be worshipping your God. And that God can also be the same God of your parents and your Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Owning it. And very often we're worshipping something from the past, something someone else told us is important to worship. And our parents could be doing exactly the same thing. It's not their God either. They're worshiping their parents' God. But owning it means, what does it mean to you? And until a person doesn't ask that question, faith will remain, as I said before, makif, and some form of dissonance. It's when you begin to own it, what it means for you, that's when it begins to become personal. And then it becomes something that you begin to have a relationship with it. Until then, it may be significant, but it's still outside of you because it's someone else's God. However, you're following it, you're either obedient, or you're a pleaser, or whatever it may be. Which is also explains another idea. In Judaism, you have, of course, many names for God. There's generally seven names, and there's even 70 names. But seven names, Shiva, Shema, Sheinim, Nebuchadnezzar, seven holy names that are not supposed to be erased, sacred names. And you've heard them, you know, Havaya is one we call Havaya, some we call it Hashem, you don't pronounce it unless you say it in a blessing, so I'm not pronouncing it. You know, sometimes it's, it's spelled A-D-O-N-A-I. That's one name. There's a name, Elohim. Every time you say a prayer, a, a blessing, we say, Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu. Hashem Elokeinu. Two names right there. Melech HaOlam. Then you have names like Kale. You have a name, Tzvokes. You have a name, um, uh, what else? What, what I count? Four? That's Four? Um, there's another three, which, uh, <clears throat> what did I say so far? It's Vokis, Kale, Havaya, Elikim. There's, uh, um, it'll come to me in a moment. Anyway, the point I want to make is actually I want to talk about the first two. So, what, so Bible critics, for example, who are, of course, ignorant about all these ideas, have come up with a brilliant, quote-unquote, brilliant thesis, that in the Torah, since you find these different names, there must have been seven different authors. And they call it, you know, author A, author B, because they're using different names. There's one small problem. If they knew how to read Hebrew, they'd see that many verses have two names. So who was the author of that verse? Hashem Elekeinu, Hashem Elekim. So yes, in the beginning it says, Bereish is bar Elekim, in the beginning Elekim is used. But later they say, B'yem Asei Hashem Elekim is Hashem Ayim Vesaretz. Sheish is Yomim Os Hashem Elekim, both. And then when it comes to the Ten Commandments, you actually have three, Anoichi Hashem, Elekecha, etc. So it's very clear that there is more to it than just simply this. people chose different nicknames, so to speak, for God. And actually, when you know the Hebrew, you know they have different meanings. Elokim, for example, refers to the God that sits, that is the God of Gvura, judgment, Din. Havaya is the name of God of compassion. But it's interesting, when it comes to the Shem Havaya, the Tetragrammaton, the holiest name, you cannot personalize that name. There's only Yud Kei Vav Kei and that's it. When it comes to Elakim, you can say Elakei Nu, Elakai, Elakei Chem. It can be applied to us. Why? Because as the Hasidic masters explain, there's the divine that's transcendent beyond us and is like an equalizer. And then there's the divine that applies to each of us individually and personally. So we say Baruch Atah Hashem Elakei Nu. Hashem is the equalizer. Elekeinu is our God. Why? Because the point is that in Judaism, we a fundamental principle of faith is, we'll call it the, 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 
than the antithesis to uh, Spinoza's pantheism. Spinoza said, God is nature and nature is God. Which would mean, there's only Elikim. But we say, Hashem Hu Elikim. And as a matter of fact, the holiest time of the year, Yom Kippur, at the end of the day, seven times we declare that. What are we saying? That the transcendent God is one with the God of nature, and the God of nature is really a God that's beyond nature. So Spinoza, God is nature, nature is God. We will say, God occupies the space of existence, but existence does not define God. So it means God is nature plus much more. So therefore, what you have then is a, a very profound philosophical idea that there's a divine dimension that's beyond us and there's a divine dimension that's within us. And the goal is to bring these two together, which requires, as the, as the mystics write, a third dimension that is beneath, beyond Havaya and beyond Elikim. That would be like the Anoichi of the Ten Commandments, the essence. So there's the essence of the divine, there's the transcendent divine, and there's the immanent divine. There's the divine within nature, there's the divine beyond nature, and there's the divine that joins the two as one fusion. So this is a longer discussion that now is not the place to go into long detail. But when you start understanding this, you start saying, one second, faith therefore takes on a whole different meaning. Faith is, the God within nature actually may not need so much faith. It's pretty clear, just like a book cannot write itself, and music can't compose itself, how can a, a, an elegant universe like this, that's far more poetic and, uh, and, and symmet symmetric than any music and any art have put itself here. So it's pretty clear that the beauty of this world, the design of this world, indicates a designer. That Does that require faith? Not necessarily, if you really think about it. The reason most people reject it, I would say, is because it causes us to be responsible. So we're invested in, that, in trying to avoid this. But no one in this world would say, for example, this building we're sitting in right now just created itself, right? You wouldn't say this building evolved from earlier stages of bacteria and just created itself or something like that. No one would say that. And yet it's, so many people will say, one second, the world just came into being by accident, Big Bang, whatever. I've always thought about why do we not have, why, do we, why is it easy for us to, to almost say to you, this book was written by itself. No one in the world would ever accept that. Whereas you say the universe created itself or came out on its own. Why would we accept that? My only explanation has been is because to say there's an architect that built this building doesn't have any consequences. So what? To say there's a God that created me that has consequences, then I have to be responsible to this God. And maybe I have obligations. And that's where people suddenly uh, balk at that. If someone told you that if you believe there's an architect in this building, you have to pay every time you enter, you may also start saying, who says? Maybe the building created itself. But we can't do that, obviously, because there's an owner, etc., etc. With God, it's easier because God does not come to demand dues, and we can choose to be non-accountable. So, of course, there's a big. If, if we were created by God, it means we have a purpose. Are you living up to your purpose? And I think most of us would rather not hear that, to be frank. So, this, we're invested. We're basically uh, let's you know full disclosure. You're invested that there's no God because life is easier that way. You don't have to be obligated to anyone. But to go back to our theme here. So therefore, really, God in nature, you can argue, is a pretty much a logical conclusion. But faith then becomes faith in dimensions of the divine that we cannot directly relate to, not within nature. How do we know there's a transcendent God? How do we know there's a God that transcends even transcendence? So there you may need elements of faith, but as I said before, faith is not the absence of reason. It's not faith that comes before reason. It's faith that follows reason. It means your mind can develop and understand many things, but then it brings you to a door. And this door you can only enter through with faith. And sometimes commitment is connected to the word faith. I mentioned before marriage, for example. Or other serious commitments we make. All the reason in the world, you, do, you go through all the logic, but there comes a point, why will you make this commitment? You will not find a 100% logical reason. It could be informed by logic. Logic has led you here. But why would you go through the door? Why would you commit the rest of your life with another person? There's always a risk. There's always an unknown. Who knows what will happen? So if you really want to play it safe and really go pure mathematical logic, you'd say, hey, even 1% chance it's not going to work, I'm not in. And yet we make commitments. And we make many commitments. And, uh, and I'm not talking about irrational ones. I'm not talking about 
uh, reckless ones. I'm talking about ones that are informed by a logical due diligence. And then you come to a point and you say, I'm in. That statement, I'm in, is more than just reason. So faith and reason work hand in hand. And faith, therefore, becomes an additional tool beyond reason. It brings us to a door where faith brings us to that place. There was a doctor who used to come to this class. He called himself an atheist. A lot of people I know, they call themselves atheists, but they happen to like this class for some reason. You know, they say, your God I can accept. That's what I've heard from a few uh, self-proclaimed atheists, which tells you about Levi Yitzhak Badditch of his life. Right. Some people have coined me the rabbi of atheists for that reason. Okay. Um, and anyway, this doctor was a, a research doctor, a medical research doctor. And he took upon himself two, three diseases, more ra- rare ones, not the ones we're so familiar with, that he felt he's going to conquer in this lifetime. That's his commitment. And he told me, I will conquer these diseases. And I always would ask him, how do you know? Maybe they're just not conquerable. Maybe some diseases can't be healed. No, everything can be done. And I used to push him intentionally. Then I said, you know something? You're the most radical, zealot believer I've ever seen. You're convinced that these things, you call yourself an atheist, but you're a total believer. You just don't call it God. You call it medicine. You call it nature. You call it healing. You know, just replace the word with God, and you're just as fanatic as any believer, even more. Because you committed your whole life. You're convinced it's going to be healed. And even if every, every medical researcher and every experiment you did that fails, no, you're going to do it again. If that's not a, a, a fanatic, you tell me what's a fanatic. I don't know if you know this, but fan, the word for fan, F-A-N, is short for fanatic. That's where it comes from. But you, hear, you never hear anyone say a sports fanatic and a religious fan, right? You know, with the Super Bowl coming, there's a lot of fans. So fan, because fan sounds pretty cool. Hey, I'm a fan. But fan is just short for fanatic, and suddenly with sports, no problem. I understand why, because sports is really uh, empty, meaningless. It comes to religion, it has real consequences. But that's another discussion. So the point is, again, just words, words, words. We all have things I would submit. I would frankly feel bad for somebody who does not have some faith in something in their lives. Faith in yourself, faith in people you love, faith in an idea, in a value. So faith in God, if you understand what God is, is the ultimate value. It's the ultimate ideal. Why is that such a crazy word? You know, I see it as, as part of the dignity of the human being that we believe. We believe in people. That even when things seem difficult, you say, no, I believe in you, let's move on. You see coaches uh, hyping up their, uh, their, their uh, the, the, the athletes. What do they do? They may have a psychological, they're a psychological block or they're in some funk. And they say, no, you can do it. And you believe it. And it pushes you. So the word belief and faith are not such terrible words when you strip it from the stereotypical religious connotations that I've been addressing. So suddenly then the word faith and, of course, its, uh, its antithesis or alter ego, heresy, take on a whole different meaning. Heresy. Here's an, a good one to, to, to try to wrap your mind around. One of the Rebbes, the name of the Rebbe Rashab, he's the fifth Chabad Rebbe. So he once said something very interestingly. Think about this. Um, someone had said, uh, someone dismissed an atheist who said he doesn't believe. He said, God does not exist, is what the atheist said. So this Rebbe said, you know something? The atheist that says God does not exist is a step closer to the truth than the believer that says God does exist. Now, how do you explain that? Because when we say God exists, we're saying God exists the way we understand existence. Like this chair exists. Like the sun in the sky exists. Like the street exists. Is that true? Or when you say God doesn't exist, he's really saying God does not exist like anything we understand existence. So who's telling the, who's closer to the truth of the idea? When we say something exists, it's on our terms. Which is why we ask where, why is God invisible and so on. I mean, One of the beautiful ideas that Abraham came to and you know the story of Abraham, I referred to it earlier. Abraham grew up in a very privileged home, but his father happened to be, the, 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 the commodity of the time was idols. Like today, uh, let's say, um, I guess, uh, what would be, uh, Netflix, then was idols. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good comparison. Or some other uh, product, oil. What's a very popular product today? Um, commodity. So he traded, he's dealt with idols, and he would have an idol. You need whatever god you needed. He was able to give you, like a psychic type of thing. So people came to him, and he built these idols. 
the pagan world, and that, that. Abraham, at a young age, realized there's something wrong with this whole thing. This, this whole thing was a joke to him. And, you know, the classic story, he goes <clears throat> and destroys the idols. And his father comes and says, who destroyed these idols? He said, well, they got into a fight with each other. They were jealous of each other, so the big ones destroyed the small ones. You know, the whole thing. His father started laughing and said, come on, between you and me, we know that that's not possible. So Abraham says, saying, this is what you're selling to your people. So, you know, I mean, that was the so-called in, inner inside joke. I don't know if his father was so humorous about it. I did a little, um, a little um, paraphrase it, okay? Anyway, Abraham rejected this uh, false uh, god and began searching. Where do you search? You go through the process of elimination. He knew clearly that these objects made out of stone or wood were not real. That's not God. There's no way that's God. Those are just you know, inanimate objects that human beings simply chose to give to a, to uh, to uh, to somewhat um, apply some deity powers to. So Abraham began to search. He went out. Where do you search? You search in nature. He went out to the meadows. He went out to the fields. He looked up into the skies and the heavens. That's what you search. Anyone will do that. He looked at the sun. Is that God? No, but the sun sets. He looked at the moon. That sets. Then he realized that the whole cosmos, everything he sees, the heavens and the earth, are all part of existence. They're just like an extension of the same tree and stone that he began with. They're just bigger. So he kept on searching and searching and searching. As a matter of fact, there are different opinions of what age he discovered God. And some explain it's really not different opinions, it's different stages of his discovery. And then he came to the ultimate discovery, which very few people are aware of. What did he discover? He didn't suddenly meet God somewhere. He realized that his whole search was based on a false premise. The fr- premise was that there's God out there somewhere. Is he in a mountain? Is he in a valley? Is he in the sky? Is he under the water? That was his premise because he was going with his own tools. That's what you do. You search on your terms. Then he realized, one second, if God created us, how could we determine the rules of how we find God? If I find God based on my rules, it'll just be a mathematical uh, a, a result of my mathematical equation. And Abraham realized, I don't want a God that's a product of my mind and my search. And he came to realize the deepest truth of all, that God is everywhere. And instead of him searching, maybe he should just shut down and get silent, and God will emerge. As the Kutzke Rebbe once said when they asked him, where is God? He said, where is he not? They offered him a penny, show me where God is. He said, give me, I'll give you two if you show me where God is not. Is the realization that there's a deeper reality that we do not perceive. And you're not going to find it out there. It's right in here. It's within. And the problem is that your, your search and your tools block the, your ability to, to experience that deeper power. That's what Abraham discovered. So monotheism is much more than just one God. It's one reality. It's the essence of all reality. And therefore, when he shut down all his tools, then suddenly God emerged. So when the first time God appears to him, what does he mean appeared? We think of it, oh, God appeared. What, what did he look like exactly? He looked like what? When you think about it, it's, it's, it's far deeper than that. When once, once Abraham experienced that sense of humility, God emerged. It became a reality that he experienced. So when you think of it that way, it takes on a whole different meaning, what belief is and what heresy is. So the person who says God doesn't exist, you know, maybe you're onto something. Yes, he doesn't exist like we exist. To use Maimonides' terms, cited in Hasidic thought, a very powerful expression, he says, Mitzias, built in Mitzias Nimtza. God is an existence that cannot de- be defined by existence. Or to put it a little more poetically, a non-existential existence. When we say something exists, it means it exists because it occupies time and space. How do you know this table exists? Because you can see it with your eyes. I see it with my eyes. It's measurable. Nothing else can stand in this place where the table is unless I move the table. For us, that's called empirical proof. Now, if I ask you, what about ideas? How do you know ideas exist? You can't see them. You can't taste them. You can't touch, smell, or hear them. So the five senses that we are so, are so seduced by and are so held hostage by suddenly, suddenly don't work when it comes to ideas, feelings. How many ideas can fit into your brain? Did you ever think about it? You think there's a limit? 
Now, if you know mathematics, the first thing you learn in Geometry 101 is that there are infinite points in a line. Now, a line is the shortest, the shortest point from one place to another. That's a line. But there are infinite points in a line. So you say, so how could there be infinite points in a line? If a line is an inch or ten inches, how could they be infinite? So you're taught because a point doesn't occupy space. So it's a conceptual point. It's not a dot. Dots, obviously, dots may be small, but there's an, only that amount of dots you can make in a certain area. But a point is not a dot. A mathematical point is a conceptual, infinite entity. That's why there can be there are infinite points. It helps you start thinking of things outside of spatial terms, time and space. And then you start realizing that, yes, ideas, feelings, require different instruments to measure them. Now, Arthur Eddington was a great uh, scientist, and he was asked, how did you come up with all these conclusions? Uh, bizarre, the, the scientists in the 30s and 20s and 30s were coming up with these bizarre conclusions, what's called today quantum mechanics, the world of the microscopic and the subatomic particles, with all kinds of literally bizarre conclusions that are very counterintuitive, not logical. You know, just to give an example, that things are there in a state of probability. We think of life as a deterministic universe. As Newton teaches, modern physics, new physics, quantum mechanics says it's indeterministic, which means you do not know, for example, in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the position and the velocity of an atom are impossible to know simultaneously, which goes against everything we know. Everything in life is predictable. And suddenly you have a reality that is not predictable. Not because we're lacking information, because fundamentally it's what's called a state of probability. If that was too much, if you never heard of this, skip it. It's not so relevant to what I want to say. The point I want to make, however, is this. So Eddington was asked, how do you come to bizarre conclusions that are completely not logical? Einstein even had problems. He said to Niels Bohr, another physicist, he said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Everything makes sense. And he reportedly responded, don't tell God what to do. You know? So two different ways of looking at uh, logic. So Eddington gave a very fascinating example. He said, imagine a fisherman who spread his net over all the seas and began to gather and collect all the fish that he caught in the net. Okay. And he began to document Different species, different colors, different shapes, different sizes. Finally, he came to a great conclusion. There are no fish in the sea that are shorter than a half inch long. You hear this? Now, he's about to make this big announcement to the wizards of the world when his little daughter, like the emperor with no clothes type of story, comes and says to him, one sec, let's see the net that you used. And they look at the net, and the net, the ropes of the net are spaced less than half inch are, are, are half inch wide and long. So obviously all the fish that he caught in the net that were shorter than half inch long fell back into the water. So all he needs to do is come with one say. Say when you use a net of spaces of half inch, you're never going to catch half inch fish or less. However, we don't need a scientist for that. Any idiot can tell you that. So his point Eddington was that it depends what instruments you use. If you say I can't see a subatomic particle, you can't use your eyes. Just like you can't use a net. A net of a half inch will never capture a fish that's shorter than a half inch. Our naked eye, our microscopes, and our instruments are too limited to be able to perceive experiences on that subatomic level. So then you need different tools. And when you start thinking in those terms, and that's why today it's far, far easier to talk about God in a way than ever, because we're dealing with invisible all the time. You tell me how cell phones work, how you can see a uh, broadcast from Australia, a tennis match simultaneously 10,000 miles away. Now we can get broadcasts now from places like Pluto that take six years for the message to come to the Earth. So these are all invisible forces. We don't see uh, sound waves. We don't see light waves. Yet you see everybody using a cell phone. How many cell phones can be used in the same proximity? No one even knows. Where's that? You know, it's not wires. So explain exactly how this energy works. We all have to somewhat... Say, I don't really know, but we know that it's there. But it's not there quite like everything else. It doesn't occupy time and space as we know it. Whole modern technology is an example of something that transcends time and space in many ways. So at the end of the day, when you start talking about then faith, do we believe in, ce in cellular energy? Do you believe that, uh, that television broadcast exact image? It, does it require faith? 
Do you have to travel to Australia and find out that is that person really there or is this some type of illusion? We just accept it. I wouldn't call that faith. Why? Because we understand that there are forces in, in life that are not visible and in some way can transmit images or sounds in ways that once upon a time we could never have imagined it. Take the mystery of the soul. We know that when a person dies, God forbid, something happens. I don't care whether you're called belief, no, I don't know whether you're a believer or not. What is the difference between a corpse, the moment it dies, after it dies, and the moment before? You look at the same person, the same face, the same body, and let's say there's not even any wound or anything like that. Whatever, the death is from some illness. Or something. What changed? What happened? So the non-believers will say, well, it's a force of electricity, and the electricity left the light bulb, so to speak. And the person who says, calls it a soul will call it a soul. What's really the difference between semantics between the two? They're both talking about something that's mysterious, that we can't really figure out. And we just know that at the moment of conception it begins, which is at birth, um, conception, and at the moment of death it ends. And we really have very little knowledge of what this force is like, and the best proof of it is we cannot replicate it. You cannot revive the dead. You know, maybe one day with through DNA, some people call that the etzem luz, whatever. You know, but the point I'm trying to make is that it is these are things are mysterious. How, t- but today everyone accepts it. So when you talk about faith and heresy, it takes on a whole different shape when you really start defining what God really means. Yes, if God was a man with a white beard on the throne, striking us with lightning when we misbehave. I would tell you I'm an atheist too if that's God. I don't believe in such a God. But if you say God is the God within that I was describing, and without, that's a whole different story. So that's what really, is, we're, it behooves us to figure out what do we really believe? What do we really understand about these things? So though I really just touched the surface, my objective here was really just to challenge the fact that most of us never give too much thought to this. If you haven't given too much thought, obviously you're not going to have a very strong definition of God. Because we don't, we don't give it thought. It's mostly what we picked up. And we either follow or don't follow what we're, we were told. Or we follow it to some limited sense. But we've never owned it. So maybe the time has come to start thinking about owning Elekeinu. Not just Elekei Avesenu and Elekei Avram Yitzhak Yankov. You know, Elekeinu, how to own it. What does it mean to you? And when you start thinking about it, you come to realize, you know something, maybe you're not such a big faithful person as you thought you were, and maybe you're not such a big heretic as you thought you were. Because you have to first define what it is that you believe and what you don't believe before you say, I don't believe in it. Because, uh, or that you do believe in it. So faith and the lack of faith, that also requires effort. You know, there was once a guy came to the previous Chabad Rebbe and he said to him, the Rebbe asked him about what he does Torah mitzvahs wise, does he put on tefillin? Does he keep Shabbos? So he told the Rebbe, "I'm an apikiris. An apikiris is a word which is a heretic, an apostate, whatever, however you translate." It. So the, the the previous Rebbe smiled and said, "From knakin semich kes vetmenish kan apikiris." Now, how do we translate that? Okay, semich kes are uh, are uh, a Russian term for um, what do we call them? Sunflower seeds. And Knak and Semichkis was an expression when people who had nothing to do all day, they would sit on corners and just, you know, you ever see people have a pile of sunflower seeds, uh, shells like this? So it was an expression of essentially of a lady gay. You know what a lady gay is? Someone that was a, uh, had not much to do. Like the story with the guy that's sitting on a bench. He's all depressed, Yankel. So his friend comes over, he says, Yankel, why are you so depressed? He says, my wife is very angry at me. Says, oh, but nothing new, she's always angry at you. No, but today something special. What happened? When she went to work this morning, she asked me, what are you going to do today? And I said, nothing. She said, you said that yesterday, that you did nothing. She said, I wasn't finished. That's called a lady. Yeah. He wasn't finished doing nothing. So nothing is also a job, you know. I'm doing nothing and I'm not finished doing nothing yet. So this would be the classic semishka kanaka, which means a person does nothing. So the, the Rebbe was telling him, you don't become an apicarius from hanging around on park benches and counting the mosquitoes. You know, that's the idea, or counting birds. You know, you, you have to earn the right to be an apicarius. You have to first know something. You have to be informed, knowledgeable. First tell me what you stand for, then you can tell me I don't believe it. You know? Like that big atheist that said, I hate you, God, as if you existed. 
See, that's already some type of a passion. <laughs> you know, you have to first define, first tell me what, it, you know, what was, what was, what was it that um, the atheist father tells his son, when you go to yeshiva, remember, yeah, the, the God they teach you about, we don't believe in. Just remember that. That's the point. So you have to first know what you're talking about before you say, I believe or don't believe. So the word belief and non-belief is thrown around very easily when in fact it requires a lot more sophistication to understand what these words are. And uh, as I said, I hope I did some justice to this topic. It requires a lot more to discuss. But I think this has scratched the surface at least. And the key is to challenge ourselves because what you believe today, tomorrow may be a whole new level of, uh, that needs to be challenged and you come to underappreciate deeper levels. And we continue the journey going on and on and on. And yes, you could come to a point where you realize everything you believed in was, uh, was, was very childish. And then you come to a point where maybe you doubt it all, and then you learn to discover real belief, what real faith is. And sometimes you have to lose a childish faith to gain a mature faith. That's also part of the process. So, I, I absolutely, B'nai Maminim, the Torah says, we are believers, the children of believers. Because at the, at the heart of it, we are people of faith. Look at young children who are yet untouched and unjaded by life. They are, but they believe. They naturally believe what their parents tell them, even if it's a lie. Until they learn that people lie. But children naturally believe, which I think is a beautiful virtue. We, of course, abuse it. And we corrupt it. But what do they believe? Because they live in a seamless reality and they assume what you see is what you get. Why should they think that things are duplicitous? And why there's a duality? But we as adults, you come to learn that life is, yes, duplicity is part of nature. Children don't believe in, don't accept the duplicity. They understand a certain seamlessness. But then, of course, we train our children to become like us, unfortunately. And now they also become duplicitous. Think of the tragedy of that. Maybe it's time for us to learn from our children what it means to be pure, innocent. Yes, it may seem naive, and it's true children don't have the knowledge yet, but that's what true faith is. Pesi Yamin L'choldover, it says it about Moses, that even after we gain all the sophisticated knowledge, we still have the innocent belief of a child. That's a tremendous thing to see. You see people who are tremendous thinkers and minds, and yet they have simple innocent belief. For a child to have innocent belief doesn't require effort. But for someone that has that type of reason and logic, and they still brings them to a door of, of appreciating the innocence and purity, that's the ultimate faith. So that's a journey to reach. First you have to go through quite a few levels. And uh, we're all on this journey together. If I could be of any help to you in your journey, in Meaningful Life Center, that's what we're here for. So please stay in touch. If I don't have your emails, please send, you know, mark, write down your email address right here on our list. And with that, everyone have a very blessed week. Until next Wednesday, we, every Wednesday at 8.15. Um, I li- it's live, but it's, um, it's also be online, which um, is, uh, and I guess, undermines people coming because they can just sit in their comfort zones, as I always put it, of their bubble baths or other comfortable scenari- sis, uh, environments and in their pajamas and just watch me. And <laughs> so God bless you all. I'm very glad that you're in that comfortable place. I hope... As they say, we have to try to make comfortable people uncomfortable and uncomfortable people comfortable, right? You know what they say, make miserable people happy and happy people miserable. I don't know, miserable is not such a good word. But we have to disrupt, uh, let's put it this way, the comfort zones of the status quo. And I hope I'm able to achieve that week after week. That would be a compliment if what I'm saying um, doesn't do much to disrupt and probably not being that successful. Okay, that's a way of measuring, uh, I guess, uh, progress. But anyway, have a very blessed week, and I mean it all with a good intention and good heart. You should all have a very peaceful week and a very uh, comfortable, but not so comfortable. A little angst doesn't hurt people to motivate them to get to greater places. Thank you very much.